Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, as uh, Daniela said, my name is Paula Urze. I'm acting as the moderator for today's session. Um, as the moderator, I would like to present the panelists. Um, Rasmus uh, Bertelsen, uh, director of uh, WSDS and leader of Inside Work Package Power and Science Diplomacy. Professor at the Arctic University of Norway and visiting professor at Ceres in Paris. Uh, and uh, Simon Turchetti um, is professor at the University of Manchester, case study author in Inside Work Package Environment. So, uh, Rasmus will be the first speaker. Uh, and this presentation is about power and science diplomacy. And the second speaker is Simon Turchetti. And this presentation is about Bosho, Brussels and Brexit, charting the environmental uh, diplomacy ancestry of Britain's separation from the U European Union. So, um, after both presentation, as Daniela said, there will be a chance for 40 minutes questions and the discussion. So uh, I think that we can go ahead. Please, Rasmus, you have um, more or less 25 minutes. So take the stage. Thank you very much, uh, Paula. And uh, let me see if I can get screen sharing to work. So, do you see my screen? Yes. Good. Uh, yes. Uh, so, um, thank you very much, Paula, for the introduction. And uh, as Paula mentioned, uh, I lead the work package two, Power with Science Diplomacy in Insight. Uh, I am a political scientist myself. Um, it's extremely interesting to be part of uh, Insight. Uh, project very much uh, driven by basic science uh, history research, as Simona will present uh, after me. And uh, what I do as a political scientist is that I have an extremely stimulating uh, debate uh, with my good colleagues in this consortium uh, concerning the historical insights and questions of concepts, uh, theory in social and political sciences. And uh, that debate about uh, theory and concepts uh, ideally links the basic science history research with uh, the strategy work, which you will hear about from uh, Jan Fegerstein from the Swedish Institute of International Affairs later this week. So, um, first of all, a reminder and introduction to those who are not familiar with Horizon 2020 research that, uh, in my view, Horizon 2020 research and now Horizon Europe research is strategic research. And my interpretation of the place of um, the place of uh, uh, strategic research is in between basic research or fundamental research and applied research. And strategic research is using um, basic research to solve a strategic uh, challenge, a strategic problem. And um, so, if we look at the challenge um, given by the European Union for the call which uh, INSIGHT responded to and also our sister project uh, S4D4C that you know through their online training. Well, this was within a greater call called Strengthening Europe's Position in the Global Context. And um, you can see more about that in this link here. 
And the uh, the challenge that this uh, that this call identifies is, and this call was formulated in 2015-16. So that already makes five, six years. And as I'll point out to you that uh, the world has changed within those five, six years. Of course, the world always changes. The world never stops changing. And the, um, the European Commission here identified that Europe is faced with numerous challenges peace and stability, migration, climate change, resource efficiency, health pandemics. And uh, I would say that those challenges outlined here, they are in the, the tradition, the way of thinking of, um, of grand challenges. And grand challenges very much motivated the Horizon 2020 research and Horizon Europe and it was also a very common way to think about international affairs, international politics uh, in recent years. And Björn Fergustin, he will talk more about that and discuss that critically. Because, as I'll point out in a couple of slides time, that, um, that, uh, that, of course, these challenges, they continue. I mean, we, have, uh, we are still in the middle of a global pandemic. Uh, climate change is only getting worse. We continue to see uh, grave situations around peace and stability, great challenges around migration. But other things uh, are happening in the international system, which... Uh, in my view, very much complicates addressing these, uh, these um, challenges here and that we must take into account thinking about science diplomacy. So what was the, um, what was the European Union asking whoever won these uh, uh, grants to do? Well, you see the assignment here, best link scientific expertise and cooperation with diplomacy and political influence to tackle major global challenges, promote knowledge and improve international relations. And you can see that uh, the European Union has some ideas about how this could be done, providing additional communication challenge, uh, channels. So the science for diplomacy uh, thinking and uh, it had some ideas about what could come out of science diplomacy, promoting cooperation and conflict prevention, rebuilding trust and fostering shared understanding across countries, uh, regions and cultures. So that was the thinking behind this call and so to speak, uh, the assignment. And then of course, the question comes how we have interpreted that assignment. And well, um, two consortia uh, won grants for uh, answering this call. It was INSIDE, which we are in now, and then S4D4C, which has just concluded. We started uh, late 2017. Uh, S4D4C has just concluded, INSIDE will conclude uh, late spring, early summer next year. And then in a previous call, there had been another action called the European Leadership in Cultural Science and Innovation Diplomacy, so ELSIT. And the three of us, we have formed, we formed the EU Science Diplomacy Cluster and that has now become the EU Science Diplomacy Alliance, which you will, um, which you will uh, uh, hear more about tomorrow afternoon. And I, apology, one second. Yeah, so, um, So um, this INSIGHT consortium, it brings together 
15 partners, uh, mainly universities, but also uh, Simlock, the uh, research consultancy that Claire Mays has introduced, and UNESCO, where Daniela Fangberg uh, works. And as you can see, it brings together all corners of Europe. And uh, I must say, it's been extremely exciting to, to work in this uh, uh, consortium. And the way we um, address this uh, uh, challenge from the European Union, um, well, uh, I pointed out the specific challenge that is given. And as I say, uh, especially as university researcher, uh, one has to wrap one's mind around that this is not a research council call where you can propose whatever you want and it has to be as uh, excellent as it, uh, as it can be. Uh, Simone Tocchetti uh, has won uh, European Research Council grants, which are the most uh, demanding European uh, research grants. And that's the, exactly the, the uh, pure basic research where this is the strategic research. So there is uh, this uh, specific challenge that's given. Then of course, uh, we have critically interpreted that challenge. And we of course, uh, we benefit from, uh, from living in, uh, in Europe, which has academic freedom, which are open democratic rules-based societies. So we as European researchers, we enjoy the great uh, privilege of being able to critically interpret and engage with this challenge. And then we have the uh, basic science diplomacy history research, the concepts and theory discussion, which uh, I am working in, and that uh, then feeds into the strategy work, which you will learn a lot more about later this week. So, um, but as I said, uh, the world keeps changing. And uh, you perhaps you will agree with me that this um, challenges perspective, grand challenges perspective was very clear in the, uh, in the call we responded to uh, five years ago. And there, I would say as a professor of international relations that as I said, the grand challenges, they very much uh, stay with us and they probably only got worse, especially climate change. But at the same time, we are witnessing what in international relations you call power transition, that the relative power between major states is shifting. And power transition, that has happened throughout history, great powers, the, uh, the um, the relative power between them, it uh, shifts. And those shifts are usually extremely dangerous. Many of the great wars between European great powers and world wars can be uh, connected with such uh, shifts in power. And of course, what we see today after some centuries of a world uh, very much dominated by the West, um, by first uh, Western Europe and now the United States, um, we are seeing the world becoming less Western and less uh, dominated by and less uh, centered around um, basically North America and Western Europe. Um, I show you here a picture of uh, Robert Cooper and um, I'm not sure if any of you remember Robert Cooper, but Robert Cooper was a very senior British diplomat who became a very senior European diplomat um, in the early years of the uh, European Common Foreign and Security Policy. And in 2005, I heard uh, Robert Cooper give a speech in St. Andrews at the annual meeting of the British International Studies Association. And Robert Cooper, he said one thing in that speech, which struck me very much in particular. He said, it's no longer our world. And of course, for almost all of us in this, uh, in this call here, uh, our world, that doesn't make much sense. 
But of course, if you were a very high level Anglo-American man, white man, it very much used to be your world. Um, and of course, what Robert Cooper was talking about in that presentation, it was that this great uh, power transition, this great shift in relative economic, scientific, technological, military power from the West to the rest. And uh, I personally think that what marks uh, many of the conflicts we are seeing in the world today, it's exactly that process. And uh, it's exactly that, especially the United States is doing everything it can to keep it its world. And I think that also very much marks the world of science and technology and the world of science diplomacy. Um, and to uh, illustrate what is happening, you see the map to the left, um, and you can probably guess what that map shows. Uh, that map shows that there are more people living inside that circle than there are people living outside. And all other things equal, uh, economic activity is pro proportional to, pop to population, all other things equal. And if you see the uh, graph, to the right, um, that's from the Asian Development Bank, and it shows Asia's share of global GDP from 1700 to 2050. And remember, it's a relative number. So of course, the world economy today and the world population in absolute terms is much, much larger than in 1700. But you can see that historically, the world was Asian centered, or perhaps not Asian centered, but Asian dominated. That historically Asia accounted for well over half of world economic activity. And that reached a relative uh, minimum in the 1950s, 60s, um, because of imperialism, wars, world wars, etc. But you can also see that the world is returning to its historical normal. And uh, I'm born in 1975. So in 2050, I'll be 75 and probably retired if I'm alive at that time. But um, you can each think about how old you will be in 2050. And you can think about where you probably will be in your professional life. And you can think about that you will have your career in a world which um, will be less and less Robert Cooper's world. And also science diplomacy will happen in a world that is less and less Robert Cooper's world. So that's, um, that's the, uh, the, at least my interpretation of the uh, of the challenges of the background that we are responding to with this work. And um, as I said, the basis of insight is basic science diplomacy history research. Uh, in these research themes, you see in the bottom right, uh, you can see there's uh, my own power with science diplomacy package, but then we have work packages looking at science diplomats, uh, heritage, archeology, span health, security, environment, and space. And uh, we have, um, you know, your, your case study uh, teams that respond uh, to four of these uh, work packages. Uh, and you have been introduced to the excellent um, science diplomacy history research in these uh, work packages. So building on that uh, basic science diplomacy history research, we have this debate between history, archeology, span science and technology studies, and then political science and international relations. And um, 
what I have enjoyed very much in this debate is uh, the richness and the uh, vibrancy of this debate. Um, we have long and deep discussions about what science diplomacy is, where you can start off with the Royal Society, AAAS taxonomy, which uh, is a starting point, which can generate a lot of discussion. Um, then you can also, we have also discussed what is meant by science. And that, of course, depends very much on the language you're using. Because I would say that in English, science is de facto natural sciences. But in my own native language, Danish, Wiedenskap, uh, or in Norwegian or Swedish, or I would say in German, Wissenschaft, um, Science are natural sciences, social sciences, humanities, technology, medicine, etc. And of course, uh, science and technology studies provide a very critical debate on the relationship between science and society. And another thing, something that Björn Fegerstein rise, raises in his material is what is meant by diplomacy. Um, uh, an immediate way to look at diplomacy is to look at it as statecraft and uh, in the service of states. But of course, uh, science diplomacy is full of non-state actors. So the theoretical concept that um, I think is particularly useful for linking um, what we are doing, the uh, our basic uh, historical research, and then addressing the challenge that I introduced originally is power. And uh, I'm a political scientist, and I would say that power is the fundamental, it's the core question of political science. Uh, questions as what is power, who has power, and why do they have power? Um, and uh, I, uh, I speak, me and political scientists, we deal with power as business-like, as cancer researchers deal with cancer. Um, it is not, uh, there's nothing, how to say, uh, judgmental in it. And uh, sometimes I come across that, wouldn't it be better to use a term like influence? I think it just uh, clouds, uh, clouds the discussion. And uh, yes, uh, power doesn't disappear because we don't talk about it. So there's been a very, uh, very, very important theoretical debate in sociology and political science uh, throughout the 20th century, uh, which uh, includes some of the main uh, social scientists. And that debate has moved from, and, and keep these concepts in mind for thinking about uh, science diplomacy and, uh, and what you're going to do this week. So direct power is that A gets B to do something that B would otherwise not do. Um, so that's very blunt and very obvious. Then you can have a gender setting power where who decides, uh, who decides what's on the agenda, what's on the menu, you probably know the saying that whoever pays the band picks the music. Then you can have ideological power where you can uh, shape other people's perceptions of their own interests. And that is of course, can be very influential. Then uh, we have the relationship between power and knowledge that uh, if you can determine what counts as knowledge, what counts as truth or false. And finally, this uh, sounds and looks uh, complicated, but structural power, that uh, there can be a lot of power in structures and whoever gets to decide those structures can have great uh, direct and indirect uh, power. So think about these concepts for this week. And um, if you're not uh, from a social or political 
physical sciences background yourself, um, you can think about that there is a rich conceptual and theoretical world to, to think about these questions. In uh, more popularized uh, versions, uh, dis uh, discussions, there are the, the concepts I just mentioned to you, that's, that's the, the core theoretical debate that has driven a lot of sociology and political science the last hundred years. And then of course, we have more public debates about power and there the concepts which link back to the deep theoretical concepts, they can also be very uh, useful. And there people often talk about hard power and that's usually a military or economic power that you either threaten somebody to do something or you pay them to do something. And then you can have soft power and soft power is uh, that's uh, a much more difficult concept to deal with than many people uh, immediately think. Um, because uh, soft power is you basically have to attract people to do something based on the attractiveness of some idea or value, etc. Then uh, you can have uh, smart power combining hard and soft power. And then what gets uh, with we, what we'll get into on Wednesday, sh uh, sharp power, where you start manipulating uh, other people's societies and political systems. And uh, we will see that unfortunately, uh, science diplomacy is getting entangled into uh, sharp power. And finally, uh, another way to think about power is to distinguish between power over others. So A is power at the expense of B or power with others. So one could say that power with others, that's the uh, grand challenges perspective that you saw in the original call. But I would say that with the uh, power transition we see in the world, it's becoming a lot more power over others, the competitive element. So to conclude, what we are aiming for is strategy. And um, then you might think, what's the value of spending time making these exercises where we ask you to uh, work with policy and strategy and implementation. Uh, what's the value of doing such exercises for an uncertain and unpredictable future? And there, um, one can think about two quotes. Um, some of you may, the more mature of you may remember the great Swedish slalom skier in the 1980s, Ingmar Steenmark, who said, I don't know anything about luck, just that the more I practice, the luckier I get. Another perspective, Pasteur said, uh, fortune favors the prepared mind. Um, they may, uh, St uh, Steenmark and uh, Pasteur, one may think that they're saying the same, same thing, but I think there is a difference and I think that Steenmark's perspective is particularly relevant for the world of foreign and security policy and uh, practice. And if I can make this link here work, so um, can you hear me? Uh, I expect you can still hear me. Yes, yes. Um, mm -hmm. Yes. So um, the similarities I see between foreign and security policy making and execution and Steenmark going down the slalom slope, it's of course the speed that things, crises, they often develop extremely fast. And just like in my Steenmark going down, having to rely on split second judgments, which of course are based on practice. Uh, as you can see, 
stain mark going down or in a crisis situation, you have to make the right call almost instinctively. And that's where the practice and the practice and the practice, that's where having thought about these things very hard in advance is extremely important. So um, I could speak at length about these things, but uh, I'll conclude here. And uh, I look very much forward to uh, work with you this week. And as I, you can um, see, I think we have a great program ahead of us uh, linking the uh, basic um, science diplomacy history research, social and political sciences concepts and theories, and then uh, thinking about how to apply that in a strategic and uh, policy setting. So thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, Rasmus. Uh, now it's time to hear from Simon Turchetti. Please go ahead, Simon. Hello, uh, can you hear me? Can you all hear me? Yes. Yes, good. Fantastic. Nice to be with you all. My name is Simone Turchetti. I, um, uh, I teach here at the University of Manchester. I'll try now to share my screen. Let's see whether it works. Can you see it? Yes. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, wonderful. So, um, hello everyone. I mean, what a nice day to meet uh, here in uh, uh, Manchester is the so summer solstice. I'm pretty much sure there's the summer solstice and most of the Northern Hemisphere as well. Uh, so it's a nice day, it's a longer day. I hope we'll have a, an opportunity to just uh, discuss some nice issues. Um, ju just as a, you know, to introduce myself, I'm slightly different from Rasmus. I'm not, uh, 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 um, if you want, uh, a, a theoretical scientist. I'm more of a kind of uh, empirical historian. Uh, I go up there, look at uh, the um, things that happen around us uh, from the perspective of understanding their ancestry and legacy. So looking, for instance, at documents and uh, archival uh, research helps me to understand where we are right now. And one of the most pressing issues that I think we are facing right now is obviously Brexit. Uh, so in this short presentation, I'm gonna just try to invite you to think about Brexit in a different way, perhaps to understand its uh, legacy uh, with the past, with what's happened, especially around the 1990s. But I use some of the categories uh, that Rasmus has used uh, already, and especially uh, in terms of understanding uh, power, power and power transitions. So let me start, first of all, uh, with an introduction of some of the terms I'm going to use. Uh, first of all, environmental diplomacy. What is environmental diplomacy? It shares quite a lot with science diplomacy because it's largely based on uh, knowledge exchanges and collaborations that have to do, for instance, with understanding the problems that typify our world in terms of environmental issues, pollution, climate change, uh, for instance, uh, the use of chemical substances, pesticides, uh, you can broaden this analysis, for instance, the um, uh, uh, extinction of species. You can, you can broaden this kind of analysis as much as you want. Um, uh, another thing that I think it, 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 both science diplomacy and environmental diplomacy share, aside from essentially being more knowledge based, is that we see uh, pretty much these forms of diplomacy as new forms of diplomacy, replacing, if you want, the traditional practices which were policy-based of, of traditional diplomacy, and in that respect entailing also the involvement of non-state actors, uh, such as the scientists as experts, also, for instance, the environmentalists as individuals that can tell us a great deal more about the nature of environmental challenges. And ultimately, I think both with environmental and science diplomacy, we see important examples of how, in many circumstances, we have an uh, important power transition from national authority to supranational 
organizations, in a sense, to deal with problems that cross national borders and become sometimes even global, think of climate change, we need uh, uh, authorities that are no longer nation-based, but they actually uh, um, uh, um, help to address specific issues from a transnational perspective. So supranational authorities that take decisions for each single state and that, that, that they are binding for nation states. I think where I'm gonna take you now is particularly relevant in that respect because we will talk about 1990s Brussels. In Brussels in the 1990s, there was a major power transition happening with the formation of the single market, the transition from the European economic community to the European Union. So something much larger and much more powerful than it was before. I think that would be a good place where to be to understand the kind of story I'm gonna tell you about. Second important thing is what is Brexit? I mean, I'm pretty much sure all of you know what is Brexit. I don't have to tell you really what is Brexit. They're talking about the United Kingdom leaving the European Union, something that happened fairly recently on the 31st of January, 2020. And it has been the subject of a major debate um, in the sense that uh, um, obviously many have been wondering what actually have been the instigating factors of, uh, of Brexit going back as far as, for instance, the British Empire, the establishment of the UK Independent Party, the famous referendum then in 2016 essentially uh, uh, led uh, the United Kingdom to leave the, 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 the European Union. And obviously you can start thinking about what kind of important power transition this has entailed in the sense of having a weakened European Union, possibly a weakened United Kingdom too, as well as more generally power shifts in, 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 in all around the world in the relationship, for instance, of the European countries and the United Kingdom with other powerful countries, the United States, China, uh, Australia, and, and more. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to kind of dive into this very important thing from an historical perspective starting to do an historical research on archival documents that could tell me a little bit more about the ancestry of Brexit. And in particular, I found very important documents in the European Union archive, which is currently based in uh, Florence in Italy. And I mean, I'm obviously thank thankful to Insight because Insight has been the stimulus as well as the, the support for the kind of research that I'm gonna tell you about. Now, um, this is something that leads me into uh, uh, looking into one family, one group of people, the Johnsons. Uh, you might recognize in that picture over there, the current prime minister of the United Kingdom, Boris Johnson, uh, first from the left, uh, as well as one of the, uh, if you want, the power engines behind Brexit, since he is the one that ultimately uh, um, uh, um, was one of the prominent figure within the Leave campaign. And actually, um, one of the things I managed to find out during my research is that actually, Boris Johnson is very familiar with the Brussels because he was in Brussels in the 1970s because all his family moved there when his father, Stanley, also in that picture, the, in that picture over there, uh, moved to uh, 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 Brussels to be appointed as a civil servant in one of the many departments of the European Economic Community. So the Johnson's family moved there, and it is important to pause for a second on Boris' father, since he actually played a key role in Brussels' environmental diplomacy scene in the 1990s. And this is where my first part of the talk will be about. So Barry, Stanley Johnson uh, was a, a really a key figure in the world of conservation and environmentalism, a member of the Conservative Party in the UK. He was also, has always been involved in various conservation groups, such as, for instance, Friends of the Earth. Uh, when Boris was a child, Stanley was called to lead the uh, European Economic Community Prevention of Pollution Division. And in the 1990s, the Johnson family returned to Britain uh, where Boris Johnson uh, joined Eton College 
and his father became a, a, a member of the European Parliament in Strasbourg, as you can see from that picture. He stayed in Strasbourg up until 1984, we moved again to Brussels, uh, where uh, accordingly to an oral history, which is available at the European Union archive in Florence, he spent six, quote, amazingly productive years in the field of environmental policy. Um, this is because in 1984, he was appointed as a science advisor, outlining the fourth European environmental action program between 1987 and 1992, and drafted the principles for the establishment of a European environmental agency, together with uh, the uh, European Commission's uh, environmental minister and former uh, Green a member of Parliament in Italy, Carlo uh, Ripa di Meana. Uh, with what Stanley described as his friend Carlo, he also completed an habitat directive safeguarding European landscape from aggressive roadmaking. And together with him, he did much more, essentially setting the circumstances for structuring the European Environmental Agency as a supranational environmental authority that would take control on a number of issues from measures to abate pollutions uh, through new types, for instance, of car exhaust tubes to controlling uh, waste releases in rivers and seawaters through checks on health effects of pesticides and other chemical substances. The climate was inevitably fertile for devolution of environmental powers to a central EU authority, even the emergence of new global environmental of a new global environmental policy movement, which was actually heralded by the 1989 Montreal Protocol uh, against the uh, uh, ozone depleting substances. This was the first really example of a global environmental agreement that would actually was binding for each country signing it. And that ultimately, as we know, was very effective in abating levels of chlorofluorocarbons, the, the substances that are uh, depleting the ozone layer uh, uh, in those years. And these important uh, uh, um, movement was announced by the Montreal Protocol but also actually had, a, if you want, a peak moment in 1982, 1992, which you may remember was the time when we had the United Nations uh, Summit in Rio de Janeiro, another important historical moment for the international environmental movement and for environmental diplomacy. In this diplomacy work uh, that uh, Stanley Johnson and Carlo Di Padineana uh, carried out in Brussels, they obviously had to face opposition from the representative of member states when even when they because even when they share the same environmental sentiment, they actually were less keen to devolve authority to Brussels on environmental matters. And importantly enough, these environmental diplomacy work did not go unnoticed in their European Commission under the presidency of the French uh, 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 commissioner, uh, Jacques Delors, president of the, uh, the, the, the commission, Jacques Delors, uh, between 1985 and 1999, Europe was transformed in a single market. In 1982, with the Maastricht Treaty on Monetary Integration, uh, we have essentially Europe become united Autumn terms serve essentially transfer of trading uh, of goods between uh, and across borders. Uh, and it is also a, a critical historical period uh, historically because it's the time when we have the end of the Cold War, the reunification of West and East Germany, which obviously entails all the East Germany also becoming part of the single market. And also other countries uh, in Eastern Europe asking to join. Uh, the single market, including Poland, Hungary, and the uh, uh, Baltic states. So uh, the laws and the other commissioners understood the importance of new environmental regulations in the dynamics of a now much larger single market. And in fact, interestingly enough, the laws was the one that actually acknowledged, acknowledged explicitly acknowledged 
the importance of Stanley Johnson's work, Boris Johnson's father's work, in uh, a preface that he wrote uh, to a, a book that Stanley Johnson wrote, co-wrote in, in 1989, co-wrote in 1989, uh, and that actually uh, emphasized the importance of the new environmental policies outlined in the previous uh, five years uh, in uh, reducing the environmental hazards, typifying the integration into a single market. So you can see an important environmental diplomacy discourse coming out from this work. That is to say, the laws uh, first, and Johnson as well, understood ultimately that uh, 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 an integration into a much larger cross-border state dimension, such as the European Union, presented unprecedented challenge, challenges from the environmental viewpoint in the sense that uh, obviously each single country had different environmental regulations and they had now to be brought together uh, because only the elaboration of tidal regulations would protect the citizens of a now vast, much vast uh, union. It was exactly, in my view, Stalin's diplomatic activities in Ripa's Dimeana's office that helped to overcome the differences between individual countries on these regulations uh, uh, regarding uh, environmental provisions. But here is where uh, we go to the second and final parts of my presentation, which regards someone that actually looked, scrutinized these uh, provisions very closely. These new provisions suddenly fell under the gaze of a young journalist just arrived in Brussels in 1989. Boris Johnson, after having left Eton, became a young member of the Conservative Party under Margaret Thatcher, and he eventually succeeded in being appointed as the European Economic Community Correspondent of the Conservative Spreadship uh, Daily uh, Spreadsheet Daily Telegraph. It must be said that Boris never discussed his father's work on the Telegraph, apart from one occasion that I mentioned uh, later, but he wrote derisively the, the, the about Tory environmentalism on the occasion of an important speech at the Royal Society by Margaret Thatcher on Britain's commitment to the Montreal Protocol. Then, in a string of articles as a Brussels correspondent, he displayed his concerns with European environmental plans for devolving environmental authority to Brussels, which he now viewed as emanating from a green lobby, what Boris judged as an, quote, aggressively green commission, even threatened to take Britain to the European Court of Justice because of the late legal levels of nitrous oxide in British rivers. So Boris Johnson documented in the Daily Telegraph with concern, with anxiety. Famously at the time, lax legislation on environmental principles had led to the accusation of Britain being, quote, the dirty man of Europe. New and European environmental reforms would have thus uh, seriously affected Britain's economy and society, as well as devolved power to decide on this matter to Brussels. For Boris, they therefore represented a dangerous interfer interference in British affairs, a sense that the UK government would have not been able to veto these provisions after the Maastricht Treaty, Boris anxiously warned on one occasion about their far-reaching ambitions. Stanley's Italian friend Ripa Di Meana was also a favorite target of his articles, especially because of the EU commissioner's dissatisfaction with the slack implementation of environmental regulations in the UK. But only on one occasion, on December 1992, Boris broke the silence he cast on his father's work uh, in environmental diplomacy at European level by reporting on a controversy regarding animal welfare. Yet, while the interviewee Stanley lashed out at the UK presidency of the EU, 
seeking to withdraw a recent directive on animal cruelty, the interviewer Boris concluded that actually this was, quote, a government success in reining back the power of Brussels. So here I'm, I'm trying to sketch a sort of uh, interesting story is a personal story, is a story of a father and a son, uh, Stanley versus Boris, possibly a, a, a deeper saga, who knows, something that obviously we uh, might want to think about uh, more carefully. In 1994, when the current prime minister of, of, of the United Kingdom returned to Britain to start his political career, taking him where he is now, um, after having vented his anger at the commission's bureaucrats uh, that actually his father had been working for and possibly had been paying for his Eton fees, um, actually he became this very important politician, but his journalistic achievements have actually been remembered uh, over the years. For instance, the Guardian journalist Jennifer Rankin indicated them as shaping and influencing the wider British Eurosceptic movement. And one of the UK officials uh, more openly put this kind of uh, claim, defining Johnson as, quote, a colorful buffoon figure setting, quote, the tone of the British debate. Of course, one may wonder whether uh, the Johnson Edipal saga, the conflict with his father, what his father was doing, uh, actually it's something that ripples uh, through uh, their entire life. Uh, for instance, his Theresa faced very recently uh, because Stanley's 80th birthday wasn't celebrated at the Exchequer, where Boris actually is. Uh, but actually, and then after that, we know that Stanley, for instance, decided to take uh, French citizenship, uh, outraged about the results of Brexit. Um, but I mean, these are personal episodes that perhaps, I mean, are less important to us. Um, what is important is actually the case. What does actually Brex, uh, Brexit uh, 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 actually means and what it is? And what is interesting is that actually we can see now Brexit as actually, uh, this, is, this is the working hypothesis that in a sense is, is, is actually uh, being developed in this paper. Um, as, as Brexit as the result, if you want, of reactionary forces that were at play in the UK already with the creation of the single market in the 1990s. And therefore, we can see Brexit as rooted in, in, in a reaction to devolving uh, powers, allowing power transitions, uh, to, to remind what, uh, what Rasmus was mentioning earlier, uh, to something that is supranational, the European Union. Uh, that would have administered uh, environmental issues for the UK um, and, and actually did so uh, between the 1990s and when Brexit happened. Uh, and actually, what is interesting is also to consider is that um, uh, essentially, um, as Johnson, as the Telegraph's uh, European e Economic Community correspondent, churned out uh, a number of articles on anything, ranging from uh, um, the new EU rules introduced uh, on manure as well as condoms, he actually matured a staunch criticism that made him leave uh, a leave campaigner and that fueled the action plans to leave the EU. And even actually what is interesting uh, 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 post-Brexit legislation, as I conclude in a moment. Clearly, for all of us, from this case, I think there's important lessons to be learned. Uh, that is to say that we want to look at science diplomacy and environmental diplomacy, obviously, as, as way forward in, in, in addressing important global challenges, as well as a transnational issues, issues that cross national borders. But in so doing, we need to be aware, and I think Brexit has increased us uh, that awareness, that actually there are uh, limits uh, in, in, in what we can do with science and environmental diplomacy, exactly because these are great challenges, if you want, to national sovereignty structures. And there are reluctance all of the times to uh, uh, move from uh, 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 national authorities to transnational authorities uh, distributing and managing power. 
And perhaps, I mean, this is where I want to end. Uh, Brexit has left us with an important legacy. The most important legacy has been uh, the fact that current EU regulation, the very same regulation that Stanley Johnson helped to uh, uh, elaborate, are no longer in place in the UK, replaced now by something called the UK Environmental Bill which in theory should have uh, reproduced the same EU legislation existing at national level, but actually in doing so has been judged uh, by commentators in the UK, has been uh, less effective than, um, than it was uh, needed. Mm -hmm. So to conclude, I would say Boris made it finally possible for the EU to stop interfering with the UK environmental affairs, uh, possibly letting many now free to pollute Britain in the ways possibly that was possible only before uh, his father Stanley actually set foot in Brussels. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Simon. Um, so uh, now it's time to to ask questions. I believe that with these interesting presentations and insights, you have uh, a lot of them. But uh, I will start with two uh, directly to um, Erasmus. And I believe that uh, other questions will come. Uh, the first one, uh, I'm going to read it. Uh, great presentation, Erasmus. Wonder is science diplomacy. Uh, politically correct, I mean power, imbalance in the world between regions and countries, have caused unfair international relations in trade, immigration flows, etc. The COVID-19 vaccine accessibly also shows exclusion of the um, more vulnerable. How can science diplomacy be built with more positive participation and outcomes for the global South. Thank you, the first one. Perhaps I can read the other one and then you answer, Rasmus. It's okay? Okay. Um, thank you for, your, for the talk. Using the idea uh, of power with the others, uh, in my opinion, requires capacity of every player how will the European Union manage such science diplomacy relationship with the weaker nations, such as the science diplomacy practices do not slide into power over others? Thank you very much. And um, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Um, Thank you very much, and, and thanks to the, the two uh, questions. Uh, these are very, very big questions. They, they're closely connected. Um, I refer to that in the INSIGHT consortium, we, we enjoy these very stimulating discussions between different perspectives. And perhaps Simona can follow up on this, because in science and technology studies, there, of course, you have these very critical discussions about relations between science and society and, and the relationship between power and science, power and knowledge. Um, as I mentioned, um, Foucault, uh, the French social theorist, uh, Michel Foucault, who has worked very much on, on this power-knowledge connection. Um, and as, the, the, as claims he points out that, of course, we have these extremely stark power imbalances in the world, which uh, many people pay a very, very high price for. Um, and the other question, um, where the, the, the question about how the European Union can work with, um, with the less developed countries or what to say, um, well, how to say the, 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 the question, the answer to the second question in, in some ways is easy. It's just capacity building. And, and I think uh, in this grand challenges thinking that I refer to capacity building, capacity buildings in the neighborhood around Europe, capacity building in developing countries. That's the obvious answer. But then as we talk about Wednesday, 
how to say, when countries like Russia, China, Iran, when they become too powerful, then of course, the West is not interested in building this capacity. And then Clancy mentions vaccines and there can of course be very, very big private financial interests in this, which opens the whole question of intellectual property rights and uh, in pharmaceutical, uh, so, uh, pharmaceutical products. So thanks for two very, very challenging questions. And, and I think at least, especially on Wednesday, we'll, we'll get very much back to these questions. Thank you. Uh, I think that uh, Simon can add something because uh, uh, perhaps to, uh, we can match these two questions with uh, your uh, narrative, you can say. Sure, I mean, there's no doubt in my view that, um, I mean, when we look at things such as science diplomacy and environmental diplomacy, we essentially look at new tools uh, of diplomacy that make greater use of uh, knowledge. Knowledge can be uh, 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 an important device in uh, shaping uh, and persuading um, across the world. And they are new devices because obviously they uh, uh, allow us uh, to uh, think about uh, uh, challenges uh, that uh, in the diplomatic world have been uh, not uh, discussed uh, that much traditionally before. The world of diplomacy has always been a world kind of uh, about state-to-state uh, -state relations, about trade, about, for instance, common interests, about shared interests, and so on and so forth. What, what the focus on the environment and on science are giving us are essentially a way to think about the reach of diplomacy as something that can actually look at uh, shared issues, a global problems, a global challenges. So that's the reason why a number of uh, move, moving beyond, for instance, what Rasmus was telling us about uh, the definitions of science diplomacy existing in the uh, with the Triple AS and the Royal Society, we have new definitions that tie more closely now science diplomacy and environmental diplomacy to global challenges. But I mean, the, I think the big shift that needs to occur for, for those challenges really becoming the center of our attention is that nation states and nation states representatives need to start to see these dimensions of global engagement as more relevant, more prominent, more important than national priorities. They have to move essentially from a kind of focus on national interest to a focus on supranational interests. And now supranational interests are, are actually embedding and, and closing uh, uh, the national interest itself. So unless we make that kind of transition, obviously we will still continue to have cases of, of, of diplomacy, even science and diplomacy and environmental diplomacy as actually uh, putting conflict, putting countries in conflict, putting countries in tensions, in situations of tensions. And, and in that respect, I think, I mean, the case I wanted to show uh, today was exactly a case where we start to see how, in any case, the transition between national to supranational authorities, which is one of the pillars of both environmental and science diplomacy, can actually create tensions, can, can actually create conflicts, can, can actually be uh, the origin of so something producing frictions uh, between countries and countries' representatives. Uh, because national sentiment can be very strong anyway. Thank you, Simon. I have more questions for you and for Rasmus. Perhaps I can read them uh, to Simon. Uh, the UK Prime Minister has today re-announced plans to turn the UK into a science superpower. To what degree do UK-based scientists have resigned to thank for this proposed increase? in science funding and ambition. First one. Second one, uh, will money and words be enough to overcome the new barriers to science and diplomacy that Brexit has raised? And what can be done to mitigate the risk that UK science will be used in future to score political points and claim a British success story away from the European Union. 
two questions for you. I mean, th thank you. Uh, thank you for the question, which is very challenging and stimulating. I mean, what, one of the, I think, the greatest uh, merits of, of, of uh, the, the academic community in the United Kingdom is that there's always been a great focus for international collaboration, has been always uh, something stimulating exchanges across countries and, and disciplines. Uh, it has always been uh, very prominent in, in promoting it. And in a sense, I think uh, um, uh, the, the, in that respect, I mean, uh, very few uh, within the uh, UK academic and scientific community have seen uh, the developments occurring with Brexit uh, uh, in positive terms. Uh, most of them have actually emphasized that uh, um, the, uh, the, the departure of the United Kingdom from, from the European Union is going to gener de definitely produce uh, um, uh, losses in terms of uh, at least stifling that climate of, of, of positive collaboration that existed that far uh, um, up, up till 2020 um, with other European countries. Uh, something that is further demonstrated by the fact that, uh, for instance, uh, the, the United Kingdom continued to collaborate uh, within Horizon 2020, However, it pays essentially uh, uh, annual fees, but uh, this has not been uh, definitely a, a solution that has come uh, in terms of being economically profitable or actually uh, making any sense whatsoever. It's more of a kind of patch up solution, pretty much like uh, the environmental bill that I mentioned in my talk uh, to uh, cope with the situation that Brexit has generated rather than actually producing, if you want, uh, pro propelling force uh, in, in, in the country or for the UK across uh, the world. Interestingly enough, uh, what we see at the moment in the UK is that in order to afford some of the costs that this new research environment produces, uh, the UK has to reduce its commitment, for instance, to uh, development uh, 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 support to development in other countries. So for instance, uh, in terms of research, one of the driving forces of the UK research initiative was the so-called Global Development Research Fund, uh, which was essentially used to sponsor collaborations with countries uh, uh, developing across the world. Uh, and that after Brexit and possibly because of uh, uh, economic consideration, has been uh, uh, um, um, largely uh, uh, reduced. And, and, and similar consideration uh, can be done to development money more generally, which actually has reduced it significantly uh, for reasons that have to do with uh, essentially uh, economic costs in the post-Brexit climate. Uh, so in that respect, I mean, there have been uh, very, I would say, negative uh, uh, um, uh, developments that might actually uh, affect uh, the UK role in, uh, in creating those circumstances for international collaborations in research uh, with uh, partners across the world. Thank you, Simon. I have uh, more questions for both. Um, just a minute, oh, okay. Uh, the more recent science diplomacy literature is quite critical and its soft power and the uh, ability to improve um, interrelations. According to this literature, science diplomacy positive legacy rests more on anecdotal evidence and less on, sorry, on uh, solid empirical studies. Uh, what is your take on this? First one. Uh, Paula, do you want me to address that right away? Yes, you yes. can start. Uh, well, thank you very much, Annalena. Uh, very interesting question. Uh, first of all, um, soft power. So uh, I have been greatly uh, inspired by Joseph Nye. I was actually a postdoc at the Kennedy School 2006 to 9 on the soft power of American and French universities in the Middle East, uh, mentored by Nye. And of course, back then, that was very much in the time of the war on terror. 
And there was a lot of excitement uh, and a lot of belief in soft power. Uh, but there, I think it's very important to remember that soft power is not necessarily good in itself. Um, and we, it's easy to think that soft power must be better than hard power. Uh, for example, Daesh, the Islamic State, I mean, to the extent that they are able to motivate um, people to go to, um, to uh, Syria as foreign fighters or women, uh, that is also soft power. So soft power is not good in itself. It's simply a form of power based on attraction. Uh, and of course, back in those days, in the 2000s, a lot of thinking about soft power was, to put it very bluntly, that the West could win the war on terror without having to kill anybody or not kill as many people. Um, so, uh, so it's important to have that, how to say, very cool headed view of, um, of, uh, of soft power. But then, how to say, looking at the results of soft power, well, one of our participants, I, I think it's Eriks, uh, works on public diplomacy. And their public diplomacy and soft power is, of course, closely connected. And uh, I would say that the end of the Cold War and the Western victory, the Soviet defeat in the Cold War, was very much based on uh, public diplomacy and uh, soft power, where basically people in Eastern Europe, Central and Eastern Europe, they preferred another social, economic, political model than the one they were living under. And that ultimately brought down the East Bloc and ended the, uh, the Cold War. So that's an example of very, very powerful soft power. Thank you. Thank you, Rasmus. And then for, um, to Simon, um, do you think there would have been ways to prevent diplomatic issues between UK, 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 uh, UK and the European Union before Brexit happened? Do you understand? Um, no. <laughs> Sorry, say it again. OK. Uh, do you think? there would have been ways to prevent the diplomatic issues between uh, United Kingdom and the European Union before Brexit happened? And uh, no. should, should we no. have noticed these issues earlier with what was being published about the European Union in the UK? Could the European Union have done anything to prevent it? I mean, sure. Uh, and I mean, there's the, the, obviously there's, I mean, the problem is, and I'm looking at this as a European, I think as a European, you know, you, you start to know that, um, that there, that there are, uh, you know, tensions and, 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 and uh, forces at play that were for, Against against uh, the idea of, uh, for instance, the European Union, and they are powerful, and they're not just just powerful in the UK. They've been powerful in many other countries, uh, and and so um, the, the, there's a there's a lot more. Certainly, there's a lot more that the European Union can do, uh, and and people working at the European Union can do to actually um, uh, fight uh, this this disgregation forces. Uh, um, for instance, uh, um, in terms of uh, promoting uh, more the kind of collaborative activities that, uh, for instance, through, uh, through, through, through science uh, and, and, and environmental collaborations have uh, helped to overcome uh, some of the problems that each individual country of the Union has been facing in the past. I think, I mean, in that respect, the activities that I tried to to uh, uh, portray today uh, of Stalin Johnson uh, and 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 Vibagnana and others involved, I think, in the environmental diplomacy scene in Europe are quite telling. Uh, we are talking about uh, nations that have come together over the past 
uh, uh, 30 years, 30 to 40 years, to essentially elaborate uh, a legislation that has allowed to improve the environmental conditions of each single country. This is the kind of collaborations that I think um, is needed to avoid uh, future tensions and, 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 and the, the reaction forces, uh, the, the reactionary nationalistic forces that actually operate, I think, in many other countries across Europe. Thank you. And then I have another question to Rasmus and another one for you, Simon. I'm going to ring them. First one, uh, Rasmus, could you comment on the power specifically related to data access, collection and storage? Uh, does data use follow into power knowledge, for example, for the purpose of enabling artificial intelligence or in relation to personal data collection uh, with for else purpose, marketing or other? First one. And then for uh, Simon, uh, after Brexit, does the European Union as particular science diplomacy mechanisms to cooperate, sorry, with Scotland within science and innovation fields, leaving England aside? So please. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Paula. And I also noticed a question from Suresh, uh, so yes, uh, which is connected to Valeria's, uh, Valeria's uh, uh, question um, and the two questions they make me think about how say the importance of the national innovation system so the relationship uh, because uh, Suryas is asking about what kinds of science and technology are particularly important for national power and Valeria is looking into the future with with the data and artificial intelligence and I would say, uh, and Simona may contradict me, but I would say if we look at the Cold War, so we had two superpowers which both had um, strategic technologies. If we just look at space, so the Soviet Union puts the first satellite in space, uh, Sputnik, the first man, Yuri Gagarin, the first woman, uh, Valentina Tereshkova, but <laughs> Today, we all have GPS in our phones. Um, so to me, that is just one little indication that as I see as a fundamental difference between these two national innovation systems is that the United States could turn its enormous investments in strategic technologies into the world's most innovative advanced economy. And the Soviet Union couldn't. Um, and then, look. so, so just to answer Surya's uh, question, that it's not just a question of what sciences and te technology, it's all, also very much a question of the national innovation system, if you can turn these strategic technologies into a highly innovative uh, national economy. And then the question of data and artificial intelligence. Well, before COVID and hopefully again uh, next year, I would go to China every year for teaching and research. And Ch China is an amazingly digitalized society. I don't know if how many of you know WeChat and use WeChat, but of course, China, 1.3 million people, one language, one, one national language, one political system, you can harvest enormous amounts of data there. And because of the political system, because of the legal system, that data can be harvested. Now, I come from Denmark, I work in Norway. So these are small liberal democracy, rule of law societies. They are highly developed, they are highly digitalized, and we have very high levels of trust. So that gives the ability to harvest a lot of data there. But I'm actually more concerned about how to say large, low trust countries 
Uh, and I'm in a way, I'm concerned that some of the large Western countries may be caught in between the Nordic countries that they don't have the Nordic countries high level of trust and they don't have the, um, they don't have the low level of protection of privacy that you would see in China. So, but, but these are questions you can discuss at length. Thank you. Simon, please. Yeah, I mean, um, briefly on the on the Scotland question, obviously, uh, all sorts of uh, new types of uh, cooperative agreements have come up since Brexit uh, between, for instance, individual European countries and the UK. The UK still being within a H2020 means that obviously there's no need at the moment to consider um, the possibility of regional agreements, either, you know, with Scotland, or Wales or whatever. Uh, but um, that's obviously a possibility for the future. Um, what, uh, um, you know, um, Europeans like me uh, like to think about the situation of the UK is obviously is that, uh, um, you know, uh, the, 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 we need now to work for overcoming all, all the problems that Brexit has, has created, not, not to actually further separate uh, the country. Uh, uh, in the in the future. Um, so uh, perhaps you can uh, give an exam example because they are asking that you can give an example of sharp power in science diplomacy. Uh, very briefly, and as I say, uh, we will talk extensively about this Wednesday afternoon. Uh, but for the audience who is not here Wednesday afternoon. Um, there is a lot of concern these years about um, scientific engagement with countries like China, Russia, and Iran. And uh, for example, the Danish Security Intelligence Service uh, has published a report, uh, has published guidelines together with the Danish Ministry of Higher Education and Research, uh, warning about all kinds of espionage and stuff like that. Um, the, uh, I was just reading earlier today that uh, Norway is considering legislation uh, that would make it exceedingly cumbersome for Norwegian, it seems, make it exceedingly cumbersome for Norwegian academics or Norway-based academics to exchange with academics outside the European Union and NATO. Um, and I mean, we, we complain that uh, our Chinese colleagues, or we observe that our Chinese colleagues, they need to go through a certain bureaucracy before they can talk to co foreign colleagues. Um, and uh, I think uh, Western countries should be very, very cautious about following that road. But there is a lot of concern about foreign interference via universities and uh, research, etc. Thank you. Simon, do you want to add something? I mean, yes. Um, I mean, Simon Maria was uh, appropriately asking about uh, other supranational uh, organizations such as the United Nations. Uh, the United Nations already in itself promotes uh, science diplomacy uh, in all sorts of ways. Um, what, in my view, is important to note here is that um, how we make it possible for science diplomacy to become a force for change uh, globally. And, and in that respect, uh, I mean, perhaps going back to some of the things that Rasmus and others were pointing out earlier, I mean, for, 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 for a number of years, we've been hanging on this notion of science diplomacy, environmental diplomacy, all these knowledge-based new forms of diplomacy being transformative because essentially they can uh, actually uh, work as, as, as devices of soft power. But ultimately, what we've managed to conclude after many, uh, several years of, of analysis is that soft power itself doesn't actually mean that science diplomacy or environmental it can be forces for change. There's still the possibility that um, countries can come into forms of coercion 
to soft power rather than hard power uh, by, for instance, means of science uh, and technology diplomacy. So that has, in a sense, has been a, a kind of eye opener and, and something that has, uh, in a sense, forced us to look at science diplomacy more critically, uh, looking at some of the examples of the past that showing exactly that type of coercive soft power that was distinctive of many, for instance, exercises of science diplomacy during the Cold War period. Uh, what we want to see now, what we certainly want to see today as a way to overcome that is, in a sense, uh, an effort to start to see uh, these as forces for changes because they aim to address global challenges, challenges such as climate change, health uh, issues, vaccines. Uh, and in that respect, uh, science diplomacy can be a force for change, but only in the moment in which we start to see really empowering more supranational entities, supranational authorities, whether it be the European Union or the United Nations or many others. I mean, I think, for instance, what we've seen recently with the vaccines has been quite telling in that respect, because we definitely have seen science diplomacy at work in the sense that the teams that have been developing the vaccines have been all collaborative teams, often bringing together nationals from different countries. But ultimately, we've gone back to a kind of nationalistic logic in the distributions of vaccines. So that, for instance, uh, national distribution has been prioritized in the UK and other countries. And many countries of the uh, global south, for instance, have been left without vaccines. So this is where we want to see science diplomacy to become a force for change. For instance, instigating, supporting uh, policies, transnational policies that actually bring countries together to think about global distributions of vaccines rather than actually preferential distribution for certain nations rather than others. So thank you, Simon. I don't know if uh, Rasmus, only the last words because we are um, running out of our time. So uh, uh, very quickly, I thought I saw on Matthew uh, make a comment about the Danish tech diplomacy. Uh, and I, I gave a link to an economics professor at Berkeley, which Annalie Saxenian, which has done great work on the role of immigrants in Silicon Valley and brain circulation. Um, and uh, quite frankly, I think that uh, Denmark is trying to compensate for low levels of brain circulation with this tech ambassador. And I don't think it's going to work out. And it just reminds of the importance of non-state actors. So for example, what the uh, Saxenian shows that it's the excessive brain circulation between Israel, Taiwan, India, and uh, mainland China and Silicon Valley, which has created the tech sectors in Tel Aviv, Taipei, Bangalore, and Pearl River Delta. Okay. So uh, I think we are, in our time. I think it's time to close the session and to thank to hold this lively discussion and your presentation. Thank you, Simon and Rasmus. I think that we have other opportunities of discussing the topic with the, the audience. And for me, it was very interesting as a moderator. And um, okay, thank you for our insights. And uh, have a good uh, afternoon, and uh, we'll keep in touch. Bye. Thank you, Hall. Thanks. Bye bye.